On behalf of the Washington Center for Yemeni Studies and the National Council on U.S.-Arab Relations, I welcome you all to this critical and timely discussion on the geopolitical crossroads in Yemen, unraveling Yemen's future amidst trade routes and conflict. A heartfelt thank you to our audience for their unwavering interest. Your presence is vital in keeping the conversation alive and ensuring that Yemen remains at the forefront of our collective attention amidst the multitude of pressing issues and conflicts demanding our global focus. We will dedicate the last 15 to 20 minutes of today's session to questions from the audience. To ensure your questions are seen and considered for the Q&A, please submit them directly to WCYS in the chat. So make sure you choose WCYS in the chat when you submit your questions. Also, I would uh, like to uh, apologize for uh, not being able to provide the Arabic uh, interpretation today uh, due to technical difficulties. Bab el Mandab Strait is a crucial checkpoint for global trade linking the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean. It is also a region of significant geopolitical importance with several actors vying for influence. Since 2016, numerous attacks originating from Houthi-controlled territories in Yemen have threatened international navigation and maritime security in the Red Sea in grave contravention of international law. The United States has since adopted a multi-pronged approach to contain these threats and ensure the safe passage of vessels in the region. Marked by increased naval deployments, strengthened military cooperation with regional partners, and the establishment of Combined Task Force 153. Since the outbreak of war on October 7th, Houthi rebels have significantly increased their attacks on Israeli and U.S. ships in the Red Sea, seizing vessels, launching missiles, and deploying drones. Due to these threats, the international maritime security construct has issued maritime security warnings for ships operating in the Red Sea. Ships transiting the Red Sea are also at risk of collateral damage due to attacks targeting other vessels or mistaken identification. Just 17 days prior, Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman appeared on Fox News in an interview covering various international and regional challenges and prospects. When asked about Yemen, he said, and I quote, to have a stable region, you need economic development in the whole region. He then added, we want to start to invest in Yemen in the economic path on all sides of Yemen, and we are in the process of doing that. Saudi Arabia's direct engagement with the Houthis has raised some concerns among some observers, fearing it could undermine the internationally recognized government of Yemen and lead to agreements that disregard the interests of the Yemeni people. Despite this, the talks are ongoing, holding out possibility of positive progress. However, a lasting resolution to the internal Yemeni conflict remains elusive. Today, we are fortunate to be joined by Colonel Abbas Dahoub and Mr. Sami Hamdi, who will guide us through these complexities and help us piece together a comprehensive understanding of their implications for the future of Yemen and regional stability. Colonel Abbas Dahuk is the founder and president of Hyphen Point, which focuses on illuminating mutual interests and bridging divides between the U.S. and the Middle East. Colonel Abbas is a former senior military advisor to the U.S. Department of State for the Bureaus of Near Eastern Affairs and Political Military Affairs and former U.S. Defense and Army Attaché to Saudi Arabia representing three consecutive secretaries of defense. Colonel Abbas frequently comments on U.S. Middle East political and military affairs, appearing on Al Arabiya TV, Al Hadath, Al Hurra, Al Sharq, and other outlets. We are also joined today by Mr. Sami Hamdi, the managing director of the International Interest, a global risk intelligence company. He advises government institutions, global companies, and NGOs on the geopolitical dynamics of Europe and the MENA region. He has significant expertise in adv advising commercial issues related to volatile political environments and their implications on market entry and expansion and management of stakeholders. Sami is a frequent 
guest on Al Jazeera Arabic and English, Sky News, CRT World, and other outlets. Welcome, and thank you both for joining us today. We will begin with a few words from Colonel Abbas. Hi. Okay. All right, uh, Marwa, thanks for the introduction, and uh, good afternoon to you and Sami and the rest of the uh, uh, audience, uh, regardless uh, where they at. Uh, let me, I think it's uh, prudent to, uh, I'm going to say, since we're talking about the geopolitical uh, dynamics of uh, Yemen, uh, I, I just want to go back a little bit, uh, do, draw some similarities between what happened uh, in 2014 and what's happening today. This way, some of the audience that are not deeply in, uh, uh, um, familiar with what's going on in Yemen, perhaps put this little uh, uh, perspective for them to uh, draw upon as we uh, go through the discussion. And, and um, my observation, obviously, is based my uh, based on me being in Riyadh back from 2014 to 2017, and then back at state from 17 to 19, dealing with the same region, especially Yemen. Um, and on 2014 in Yemen, as you know, when the when the peace talk um, <clears throat> ended, and then the Houthis were on the forefront, they're out there, uh, marched towards Sana'a. Uh, the, uh, the Saudi government asked the United States for help. He said, look, this is a non-state actor, and they show some evidence that they're actually supported by, by Iran, and they want the support from the Obama administration. And the Obama administration at that time said uh, to the Saudi government and the Yemeni government that this is a this is a civil war inside Yemen. We're not uh, we're not going to get dragged to another war. <clears throat> this is uh, this is uh, your war, and um, also do not try to drag us into another war in the Middle East. Uh, the Obama administration basically the message is we're tired of the wars. We need to pull out. Don't drag us back in. So the Saudi government force was forced to uh, form a coalition. It was uh, I look at it. It was the uh, the only fighting coalition outside Western powers. Now that's something different. You saw we we before that you know there was a counter ISIS coalition that was 80, 80 countries to 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 also fight a non state actor ISIS, but this was a fighting coalition with uh, led by Saudis with uh, regional countries to uh, and they uh, to to fight the uh, the Houthis. Uh, so the, the coalition did uh, go in Yemen, as we know, tried to, uh, the military did some significant uh, 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 successes. I mean, they destroyed some strategic targets. But with the most important uh, success for this coalition, that they uh, there was a United uh, UN Security Resolution 2216 that formalized basically the coalition that has the same objectives as the, as the fighting coalition. The objectives was... To move uh, to move the to the Houthis out, uh, outside Sanaa to go back to their original lines to uh, relinquish all this uh, all this military weapons that they got from the Yemeni uh, Yemeni government and military and so on. So that 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 was I think that was a political success. What also the the coalition did they, they formed the uh, the King Salman Relief and Aid Center. Uh, to provide aid for the Houthis. And this is unprecedented. This is equivalent to the USAID for the United States. It's unprecedented where you have a coalition fighting in, in a country. At the same time, they have a, 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 a large aid center to provide aids to all Yemenis at that time, not just Yemenis inside in the southern Yemen. They were providing aid all the way to uh, northern Yemen and to Sana'a. So all this, you know, uh, you know, we're trying to bring, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia trying to bring the, uh, so, uh, U.S. to help, and that uh, they said did not help. The only thing, uh, Department of Defense, the Department of State were pushed back a little bit, and they got some support with air to air refueling and some uh, some uh, military intelligence. And that's and the war obviously con uh, continued still um, uh, till uh, le the, re the truce last year. Fast forward, uh, I mean, uh, Houthis were still Houthis. They still, uh, you know, they uh, they were working with Yemen since then. Houses that they had some uh, ballistic missiles at that time. They modified them, but as you, as with time, they start modifying the ballistic missiles. Modified modified some air 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 to air missiles. I mean, uh, surface to air missiles. Then they start getting uh, UAVs. Now they have UAVs and they have cruise missiles and so on. So Houthis consistently uh, kept to uh, mod, uh, getting trained and getting armed till today. So what's happening today is a little reverse. Uh, United Saudi Arabia is uh, uh, was was uh, uh, successful with the uh, with the U.S. envoy to have a truce. Uh, everybody is basically as a it's a it's a balanced truce, but they're not fighting. The uh, Sana'a airport is uh, open. Hodeida Air uh, uh, is open. 
So there is some kind of discussion. There is a, the, the PLC are there somewhat trying to stand on their feet. Uh, but the United States, now the United States is forming a coalition, which is the CMF, the Coalition uh, Maritime or, uh, ta Task Force, Coalition Task Force 153. It's a maritime uh, uh, coalition. They wanted the Saudi uh, military and the regional countries to join the U.S. Uh, coalition to fight the Houthis. And such a, it's, uh, so it's like a reverse role. And, this, and the Saudis and the regional countries are, at, at this point, reluctant because there is a balanced, balanced uh peace with Houthis, and the last thing they want, expand this to uh, and go back into this uh, uh, the fighting between uh, the, the regional countries and the Houthis, because the Houthis, they still have the uh, power, the military uh, um, uh, power to uh, fire uh, ballistic missiles or cruise missiles or UAV back into Riyadh or back into the airports and so on. Uh, so it's uh, uh, so it's a uh, it's a very uh, seems like a reverse role, but uh, Houthis are becoming international players again. No, no doubt, Iran is behind the whole thing. Most of the uh, uh, the missiles they, they possess, the Houthis have. We all know they're, they're, they were not manufactured uh, manufactured in, in Sada and, and Sanaa or Sada. They all came from the outside. Uh, Iran continued to feed them uh, uh, information, continued to uh, help them on the uh, information operations. Uh, and now it's uh, uh, it's uh, the the uh, what's going on in the maritime um, uh, tra uh, lanes. Obviously, it's not only a Yemen issue; it's a regional issue. It's an international issue, and has to be dealt with. Uh, overall, my last comment on this: uh, while the Houthis are trying to get involved with the Gaza campaign, they by launching uh, little rockets here and there uh, north towards uh, over the Red Sea. But uh, the most, the more, the successful point for them is the is their uh, interruption of the uh, uh, commercial lanes, and uh, and this is uh, this is pretty much an economic war on on um, on Israel. As uh, there was a recent report from a report from the Wall Street Journal that uh, all the insurance and the security uh, 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 the charges or fees are 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 increased by by two hundred folds. So every ship that is actually going to dock in Israel has to pay at least uh, uh, over 200% more on dock on fees, insurance fees, and security fees. So it's uh, the uh, it's complicated, uh, not only on the regional outside Yemen, and it's more complicated uh, inside Yemen. And I think we can talk about that a little more uh, as we go along. So I'll stop here. Thank you, Thank you. for the introduction. Uh, I will take it now to uh, Mr. Sami Hamdi to uh, uh, also give us uh, his um, insights before we go into the questions. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for organizing this. Apologies for the delay. I confess to the audience it was my fault. And uh, thank you to everybody for the understanding. And uh, I heard, uh, you know, Dr. Abbas say good afternoon. It's a good late night evening from where I am. And I'm sure we're with different time zones. But uh, thank you very much for organizing a very timely conference. And I think it was well worth starting with the final points of this war, because I think that Yemen is often should be remembered as the forgotten war, not because people don't talk about it, but because they don't talk about it within the framework or unique dynamics that are associated with Yemen. Instead, they talk about it in very simplistic terms, Saudi versus Houthis and these others and the like as opposed to this idea that there was a national dialogue where everybody came together to agree on a government and the Houthis didn't like the agreement. And therefore, they allied with Ali Abdullah Saleh, brought down the government and plunged the country into a war. I understand that a lot of uh, writings on Yemen tends to neglect the severity of these particular events and focuses very simplistic in a very binary of Saudi is doing something in Yemen and the Houthis are resisting the Saudis a narrative perhaps that hasn't been very conducive in trying to find a peaceful resolution. I won't delve too much into the politics. A lot of that has already uh, been mentioned, but I will mention uh, the topic with regards to what we're discussing today, which is the commercial side of things within Bab al-Mandab, its importance, the threats that are taking place in Bab al-Mandab. And it's important to stress that the importance of Bab al-Mandab is such that everybody wants to establish a military base in Djibouti because Djibouti is considered the part that overlooks Bab al-Mandab. It's such an important waterway that everybody wants to ensure that no single power has the sole influence with regards to the shipping routes that go through Bab al-Mandab, which is why the Houthis have been quite lucky in that be there in that choke point where Bab al-Mandab is and therefore their missiles have caused some sort of disruption. But also the issue of trade routes 
is one that is becoming a very hot topic between the regional countries and indeed in Washington itself for two reasons. The first is that if you look at a map and you look at China, for example, you realize that China's only access to the sea is to its southeast coast. The rest of it is pretty much landlocked, which is why China has been trying to push for this Belt and Road Initiative in which it is able to connect through Asia all the way to Europe to add an alternative trade route to the shipping routes that go through the Suez Canal, through Bab el Mandeb, all the way to China, trying to cut that time, essentially trying to revamp the whole economic geography of that region by going through those Central Asian countries. And Turkey, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, actually celebrated the fact that Turkey would be the main corridor through which it would go into Europe. The reason why I mention that is because it's seen as not necessarily as an alternative to Bab el-Mandeb, but as given that Bab el-Mandeb is considered a route almost exclusive to its own, it's about establishing a land route. And the discussion of trade routes has evolved in this regard, so much so that at the G20 summit three months ago or four months ago, time is a bit of a blur in recent times, but we saw the announcement of the Middle East corridor in which the goods would go from India. They cross a very short passage on the sea. They land in the UAE. They go through Saudi Arabia, then through Jordan, then through Israel and beyond. So the first point is the reason the issue of Bab el is such a hot topic is not just because the Houthis are firing missiles and disrupting the channel lanes and the like, but also because there is a very concerted effort on the part of regional governments to find alternative trade routes that link east and west. China is already trying to do with the Belt and Road in Initiative. And now there is this announcement of the Middle East corridor through UAE, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and the like, something that Saudi Arabia in particular is very keen on because any route that goes through Saudi Arabia will naturally benefit Vision 2030. But the second reason why there's a pursuit for alternative trade routes, aside from Bab el Mandeb, has to do with Israel and normalization of ties with Israel. Jared Kushner constantly argues that the way to achieve normalization of ties with Israel is to economically integrate it with the region, to make it economically indispensable in the region, which is why you notice that both the Belt and Road Initiative and indeed the, the, the Middle East Corridor, both of them see Israel as the conduit through which it will end up going towards into Europe. This idea being there is an awareness to get the US on board with these trade routes, Israel must be at the center. And that's why the Turkish president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan at the United Nations, went and sat with Netanyahu for the first time since he came to power in 2003 to say to Netanyahu quite bluntly, Please don't make a route that goes through Saudi Arabia and UAE. Let it come through Turkey and then go into Israel. Don't exclude us from this from this new trade route that you guys are planning. Let the trade route come through us as well. The other uh, another event that highlights the importance of the new trade routes and commercial routes that are trying to be established and the reason I'm highlighting these examples is to emphasize the vigor with which states are trying to pursue alternatives to Bab el-Mandeb because they recognize its volatility as a result of what's happening in Yemen, but just generally, given that the Middle East is considered to be a very combustible region. That another uh, evidence of that is the idea that when it comes to uh, Turkey pursuing those trade routes or asking Israel in order to uh, go through Turkey and not go through Saudi Arabia and Jordan, we see quite frankly that the purpose of the routes is also to try to get Israel to be at the center of this. And that's why we've seen the suggestions in the past of an alternative canal to the Suez Canal. That's why Tehran and Sanafir, when they were handed over to the Saudis, the Egyptians were very upset, the Egyptian commentators, because they believed that Tehran and Sanafir was designed to be a means through which to protect Bab el Mandeb, but also a conduit through which to build an alternative canal. I still think some of that is conspiracy theory, but the reason why I mention it is to highlight how sensitive the issue of alternative trade routes has become, which brings us back down to Yemen now with regards to the Houthis. Now, I know that the Houthis have been firing missiles at the ships, but I remember John Kerry in 2014 or 15, when 2014, when the Houthis entered Sana'a, and when they did the I have no idea what the English translation for it is. The agreement of, of, of peace and, and cooperation, or whatever it is. But, but I remember when they did it, John Kerry made a statement similar to that we can work with the Houthis on issues related to counterterrorism or the like, suggesting that in reality, as Dr. Abbas mentioned earlier, the idea being that the Americans saw this as just a civil war, that this wasn't something that we have to take sides on. You guys are on your own in this. 
publicly will say, yeah, we're with you, but privately, whoever wins will deal with them at the end. And I think that one of the things that the Houthis are trying to do in Bab al Mandeb is to disrupt, not for the sake of disrupting, but to disrupt in order to show the world that they are a power that must be spoken to and must be talked to, and that therefore they can be the guarantors of security in Bab al Mandeb. And that's a means by which they're pursuing legitimacy. And I won't go on too long. I know there are many points that we'll emphasize later on. But one of the things that has been quite fascinating is that as a result of the first point I mentioned, where people are unaware of the unique dynamics of, or inner dynamics of Yemen and therefore have emerged from this with some sort of sympathy towards the Houthis, despite their toppling of the internationally recognized government, we've seen that as a result of what they're, what they're operating in Bab al-Mandam, and I see it on my own social media as well, people celebrating that Yemen is standing up for Gaza, that the Houthis are standing up for Gaza. And that has resulted in, to put it quite frankly, and I say this, even if it doesn't sound academic, I say this with a heavy heart, it's resulted in a surge in their popularity in the region amongst public opinion, particularly given that the internationally recognized government it's suggested that it is it's stated that it's willing to enter a coalition to, in the words of critics, protect Israeli ships from the Houthi missiles, something which in the Arab world, for anybody listening in the Western world, for the Arab world is considered a huge thing. But I think that the Houthis also, with regards to Bab and Mendeb, are trying to position themselves as security guarantors, because even though they say death to America, death to Israel, I think in reality they want to talk to America and they want to talk to the international community and secure that international recognition. I think part of this, but but to, to summarize the idea of the trade routes of Bab and Mendeb, the vigor with which states are pursuing alternatives, Middle East Corridor, Belt and Silk Road, Erdogan getting closer to the Israelis, saying then please, please don't go through Saudi and Emirat, come through us instead and we'll have good relations. It highlights just how serious this issue is and how important what's happening in Yemen is with regards to the future of those particular trade routes. I'll leave it there and then and, and we can pick up on some of those points. Thank you for your remarks. Okay, so... Um... There were a couple of points that were that were mentioned here that are very important and you know that are per pertaining to non-state actors um, specifically. So, um, Colonel Abbas, I, considering your expertise in, in you know political military affairs and, and U.S. national national interests, what is your assess current assessment of the interplay of the regional um, competition and, and mutual interest in Bab al Mandab? Uh, in a sense, um, what are the objectives of the players causing instability? I mean, um, um, Mr. Hamdi did mention that uh, uh, for the Houthis, it's uh, placing, giving them a, a, an important seat at the table, although they are a non state actor. How can these competing interests be reconciled without compromising Yemen's self-determination and national interests in the future? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, the self-determination of Yemen obviously still has to come from within Yemen. I mean, Yemen, had, this is self-determination is a Yemen, Yemeni, Yemeni type discussion. They have to figure out uh, their uh, their economic and political cooperation and how they want to run themselves. I mean, even the uh, uh, the Biden administration or United Nations or even the regional countries, they, they look at the Yemenis to come up with solution for inside Yemen. And I think this escalation with the uh, on the um, on the uh, Bab al uh, yeah, has it has some strategic uh, perhaps uh, uh, or uh, goals uh, via Iran about. Uh, uh, you know, perhaps hindering some of these uh, corridors, whether through uh, whether through uh, Turkey or whether through Iraq or whether through uh, um, uh, through Saudi Arabia. Also, remember, uh, Russia wants to do also a corridor from uh, from India through Iran to Russia too. They also have they would like to do something like that. But the recent the recent uh, escalation is all has to do with. Um, uh, with the Gaza campaign, I mean, this is a uh, Iran is capitalizing on, on on what's happening there, so they can uh, towards their political goals. Uh, there, there is a, a synergy or coordination between um, uh, Iraqi uh, um, uh, non-state actors, uh, also Syria, Hezbollah is already pretty much at a low boil war with uh, with uh, with Israel on the northern borders. Uh, after all, uh, Lebanon or Hezbollah lost over 120. Uh, uh, you know, kill, uh, killed in action or killed thus far. So that's uh, that's a uh, you know, there's uh, something going on there. And also, what the Houthi is doing on the around the Bab and Mandeb. 
all that is uh, all related. Uh, uh, and, and, and what the U.S. did, all the surge of uh, U.S. presence in the region with the aircraft carriers and the destroyers and even uh, uh, Marines and um, uh, submarine, all that, this is also to, uh, to uh, deter uh, any uh, non-state or state actors to, uh, from uh, expanding or taking advantage of the war on Gaza. So, uh, so all this, uh, it's basically linked to what's happening uh, in Gaza and, uh, it's, uh, and um, Iran's influence and their uh, malign uh, interference in the region. Uh, so I think, um, um, uh, again, it's all, it's all connected and um, um, uh, we'll just have to uh, wait and see uh, what the Israeli government uh, next move uh, in, in Gaza, because that's what's determining the whole uh, um, the whole dynamics in the region. Even the United States have put in some pressure on the Israeli government on Netanyahu, and it seems that they're uh, they're not uh, uh, they're not listening. Their operations are driven by uh, uh, vengeance versus uh, intelligence or uh, some kind of strategy. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see. So to follow up on on that, um, and and with you know, there's increasing evidence to suggest that the Houthi rebels will continue to escalate. Mm-hmm. Um, how are there continued threats to the um, maritime security in the Red Sea uh, impacting the negotiations uh, with the Saudis? Uh, and what role is the U.S. playing in this de- de-escalation? Is it safe to assume yes. these negotiations are not successful? or And, and what could be the um, implication on Yemen's long-term stability? Well, you know, the United States is now, like I mentioned earlier, they're trying to form a coalition. I mean, just like the what I mentioned in the, the beginning in 2014, when the Saudi government saw the Houthi, Houthis as a threat. And really, at that time, they even, they even sent signals to the United States government. And they said, look, this the war on Yemen, the war on Houthis is not just for us here in the region. If the Houthis uh, succeed, Everybody loses. That was the that was the message from back in 2014. So now 2023, what the U.S. is doing, uh, they're they're also they're forming this uh, this task force 153. Well, it was formed about a year ago, but at this point they're trying to ask the region uh, regional countries and other countries to be part of this this task force uh, to uh, counter uh, the Houthis uh, uh, and the piracy across the Red Sea and the Bab el but this is uh, this is like you're treating the symptoms. Uh, this is not gonna uh, uh, most likely deter the Houthis at all. Uh, and um, uh, I mean, the, the issue is uh, um, is Iran that can continuously smuggle uh, capabilities uh, and weapons and training the Houthis to do uh, to do more. I mean, again, those anti-ship missiles they weren't produced in, in Yemen; they were smuggled. And the Yemeni armed forces never had those kind of missiles. So all that being produced from uh, uh, smuggled in, inside from uh, most likely uh, uh, from uh, Yemen. Uh, the Saudis they're uh, uh, they're listening. I mean, uh, the uh, uh, Saudis are happy with the truce it started last year. Uh, for the last uh, since the last year, there was no cross border uh, 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 operations at all. I mean, there was uh, pretty much uh, quiet. A year before that, there was over over three hundred uh, cross border operations against Saudi Arabia. Uh, and uh, so the, uh, so Saudis would like to uh, and the region would like to continue this uh, this uh, truce and uh, uh, hoping for uh, some kind of peace within Yemen. Thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna take it back to um, uh, Sammy here uh, and and talk a little bit more about the uh, Iran Saudi rapprochement and uh, how that's playing out uh, amidst all of this. So, um, you know, part of Saudi's uh, um, uh, plan is to promote this regional economic corporation. Um, and, you know, uh, d- by doing that and, and having joint infrastructure projects and, and free trade zones is a way to incentivize uh, peaceful solutions. Uh, however, considering the um, that Saudi and Iran are both on competing trade routes, what is the f- how feasible is the solution, and what steps could be taken to ensure a constructive balance of competition and cooperation while promoting regional stability? Uh, I need to find a 
a, a good way to answer this that doesn't get me in trouble. First of all, I think that the the the, the Saudi, I think rapprochement is the wrong word to use with regards to Iran and Saudi. I think that in 2019, when the Houthis hit the Abqaiq oil facility, mm. I think the Saudis were convinced this would be the time that the Americans rush in and they will finally protect Saudi and get involved with the Houthis. When they didn't, I think it caused a shock amongst the Saudis. And essentially it was, they considered the betrayal from the Americans that even this would not necessarily get them involved against the Yemenis. And therefore, I think that the Saudis then began to open channels of communications with the Iranians and the Iranians who are struggling economically thought it's a good time to sit down and talk as well. And they began talking with one another. The Saudis essentially saying to the Iranians, what will it cost to get you to get you off our backs to stop firing missiles at the royal palace as they did when Ashda Shabi fired missiles from, from the Iraqi border towards the royal palace. The Houthis fired missiles over Jeddah when the Saudis were hosting Formula One. The Saudis said to the Iranians, what will it take to get you off our back? We're tired of what you guys have been doing. You've surrounded us from the north with Ashda Shabi. To the east, you're present over there. The Houthis are now down in the south. The Saudis were caught in this catch-22. They didn't want to deliver the internationally recognized government in its form in which they believed the Muslim Brotherhood had too much influence over it, nor did they want the Houthis to succeed. They were caught in no man's land, and I think that limited its ability to create an effective working unit that could push back against the Houthis. And then eventually, we all know when the UAE announced it for the drawing, the UAE said, forget it, this is going nowhere. I'm going to support the Southern separatists and establish my influence over the ports in the South, and you guys can do what you want with the rest of Yemen. But the point here being is that if we call it a rapprochement, I think it's more the Saudis saying to the Iranians, look, what do you want? So the Iranians said, we want, for example, Bashar al-Assad to come back to the Arab League. Saudi said, okay. They brought Assad back to the Arab League so that they could facilitate investments into Syria, where the Iranians might be able to get their rewards for protecting the Assad regime. We know that the Iranians have been upset with Assad. They doubled the price of fuel that they delivered to Assad. Assad established a free zone for Iranian companies, but the Iranian companies found that the Syrians are very reluctant to allow the Iranians to set up in those free zones, primarily because the Syrians believe they don't have enough money. So the point is that it's the Saudis saying to the Iranians, what do you want in exchange for peace? The Iranians wanted support for Iraq. The Saudis agreed to give $6 billion to the Iraqi government. The, Sa the Iranians wanted more negotiations with the Houthis. The Saudis engaged in negotiations with the Houthis. And it, it appears, according to rumors, that they have established some sort of framework agreement that could be signed in Muscat very soon. I, I, I spoke with some of the Houthi spokespeople a couple of days ago. They still, they're cautiously optimistic. They still believe it can be ruined. But the point here being is that I think that it's the Saudis saying to the Iranians, look, we are, we are tired. I want to focus on Vision 2030. I want to focus on my economic development and also adopting the same idea that Jared Kushner has, which is that if we have common economic interests, there will be less of a need for political uh, machinations or conflict. The reason why I think that it's more a truce than a long-term rapprochement is because Iran in the region pursues a very ideological policy. Many of you will remember that video of Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis who was the leader of the Hashd al-Shabi in Iraq, where he's talking to some students in Iran and they are telling him, you know, yeah, Mujahid, one day, you know, we will take uh, Al-Quds back from the Israelis. And he said, no, no, the target is Riyadh, Riyadh. It's, it's, it's Saudi first. And I think that the Iranians have this very ideological aim. Khomeini in his book actually wrote many years ago that... Uh, Allah gave the caliphate to the Arabs and to the Kurds and to the Turks, and now it's time for the Persians to assert themselves as well. And we also know that we've heard members of parliament in Iran as well saying that we in Iran now control four Arab capitals. We control Beirut, uh, Damascus, uh, Baghdad, and the Sana'a as well, showing that they envisage this, which, which leads the question that, okay, if you're saying Saudi Arabia is going for this rapprochement, why is Iran agreeing? Because Iran sees an opportunity now to entrench its gains. The Saudis are now talking to the Houthis on the basis that, according at least to the internationally recognized government, a fear that they're talking to the Houthis on the basis that they will allow the Houthis to entrench in the northern territories, that they will allow Houthi to stay in Sana'a, they will allow Houthi to stay in Amran, in Jov, in Sa'da, and these places. There's a bit of dispute over Ma'rib, the idea being that if the Houthis take over Ma'rib, they will have greater autonomy. If they don't take Ma'rib, they don't have the resources to assert greater autonomy. But in terms of Iran and Saudi Arabia, the economic side of it is less relevant than the political side. And, 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 and I'll wrap up on this particular point here, which is that when Saudi Arabia unilaterally began to talk to the Iranians, it upset the Americans. And that's why we saw traction in the Americans offering a NATO-style security agreement 
access to nuclear technology and also support for Vision 2030. It's why we also saw an acceleration of normalization talks between Saudi and Israel. The, 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 the faster the normalization talks with Israel go, the slower rapprochement with Iran goes. Because for Saudi Arabia, rapprochement with Iran was a reaction to disinterest from the US. It was not designed to be a long-term strategy. It was a reaction that, look, we're getting missiles sent over here. The US is doing nothing. Khalas, uh, we know they're surrounding us. Let's go talk to the Iranians and establish a truce. But Biden has already indicated that even if the NATO-style security agreement won't go through Congress, he might order the Fifth Fleet or some of the fleets in the US to provide that sort of agreement with the US. The Reuters reported that the Israelis have no problem with nuclear technology being given to Saudi Arabia. And at the time when these reports were coming out, that's when we saw the Iranians becoming louder in complaining that the rapprochement process was slowing down. And that's why I think that when we look at the Iran-Saudi rapprochement, it's not primarily driven by economic lens. The economic side of it is part of trying to get the Iranians to agree to uphold the truce, because the Saudis absolutely do not want a return to missiles being fired over Saudi Arabia and worrying companies or the like. I talk to many corporate clients that they tend to be worried about the security. Clients never tend to be worried about who's in charge. They're worried about two things. One, uh, transparency. So they're concerned about the arbitrary nature that decisions are made in Saudi Arabia, that the crown prince today can wake up happy and tomorrow he can wake up angry with somebody and blow up his whole project. And two, security. So they are concerned about the missiles that get fired you know, across into Saudi Arabia or the like. But the point here being is, I know the question was put in economic terms, but I argue that it's the political nature of the Saudi-Iran talks was a reaction to disinterest from the U.S. And the more interest U.S. shows in Saudi security, the slower we will see the pace of rapprochement between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Because for the Saudis, and I finish on this point, anybody who opens a map, if you're sitting in Riyadh and you see the way Iran has surrounded you and cemented itself and, and you believe the next target is going to be you, uh, I think that the Saudis have good reason to fear the long-term effects of what Iran is doing. And I think that this particular talks won't lead to long-term economic gains because Iran is interested in a political gain. And that economic side is merely a transit route to achieve that. Okay, so uh, I'm I'm gonna say uh, we have um, we have about six more minutes before we go into the Q and A session and taking questions from the audience. But I do have two more questions. Uh, if we could, uh, you know, get an answer on them briefly, uh, Colonel uh, Abbas. So uh, assessing Iran's increasing influence um, in strategic regions in the Middle East, uh, particularly in Yemen, in this case. Has its strategy increased its leverage on the international community regarding lifting the sanctions? And what are the possible repercussions of, you know, we were saying increased economic ties or increased political ties between the uh, between Iran and the Gulf on the long longevity and effectiveness of their proxies? Well, definitely that uh, was not helping Iran. The United States uh, continued to um, increase <clears throat> sanctions on uh, Iranian entities, Iranian uh, personalities. I mean, recently they added the uh, Quds Force commander. They added him on the, on the sanctions list. But I do, uh, I do like what uh, uh, Sami's uh, assessment and how he uh, packaged the whole relationship between Saudi Arabia and Iran. That's uh, spot on. But I think what is, what's missing of this is uh, two things. One, uh, it's not clear exactly what Iran wants. I mean, now there are all this ideology and all this uh, long-term uh, lofty goals of uh, leading Islam or the, uh, become a caliphate, but but those are not you know realistic uh, political objectives these days. So it's still very very unclear exactly and what uh, what the Iranian leadership wants. Uh, and even if they whatever they say is uh, still uh, uh, nobody will believe what they say, and nobody will take that to a political discussion. So that's a mystery. The other mystery is also the United States does not have a clear strategy on Iran. Iran is a, is a one of the top uh, one of the top five enemies of uh, United States according to the our uh, uh, defense strategy. I mean, Iran is at the same uh, place like China, Russia, North Korea, and the terrorist organization. So to these two things that are not exactly known. What is the uh, 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 Iranian strategy, uh, and uh, also their uh, traditionally uh, not trusted on what they say. 
And the same thing with the uh, confusion on the United States, uh, what is actually the United States is, uh, is, uh, uh, wants to do with Iran. So that's what complicating the, uh, the formula and also uh, puts the uh, region like the Saudi, uh, uh, Saudis or the Gulf states in, uh, in general, and even Israel, like, okay, so w- w- how can we approach Iran? What can we do? So whatever they do, it's, it's temporary and, um, uh, and, um, uh, and it might not uh, uh, be very positive at the end. But again, just uh, on uh, what Sammy said, that's as I think was very good analysis on uh, this rapprochement between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran. So my final question to um, uh, Sammy, considering Biden's recent rem- remarks on Netanyahu's government and the you know the ongoing war uh, in Gaza, how will the nego- negotiations around the trade route differ now from previous normalization conversation? And how will the U.S. balance the Red Sea security and its interest in the region? I personally think there would be no impact at all whatsoever. And I think the reason being is that there are enough signs coming out of Saudi Arabia and the UAE that normalization remains a priority, that the Abraham Accords have brought benefits to their foreign policy or the like. And I think that Jared Kushner, Thomas Friedman, and even the Saudis themselves haven't ruled out the fact that normalization talks will continue. So I think in this regard, I don't think there will be much impact. Moreover, I think that the U.S. drive to push normalization has to do with putting Israel at the center of these trade routes. And that doesn't seem to be something that the UAE or Saudi Arabia object to, provided that from Saudi Arabia's perspective, that there is ample support for Vision 2030 for the reforms that have taken place. Remember, put yourself in the Saudi Crown Prince's position. In 2018, you did a tour of the US. You came and you met everybody who's anybody. But then the Khashoggi murder meant that there was reputational risk. Companies didn't come in the way that you had hoped to. And then when that cloud started to clear, the Houthis started firing missiles, which made companies feel uncomfortable again. Then when you started talking with the Houthis, COVID came. So again, nobody came because the global investment climate was becoming difficult. Then when COVID lifted, Biden came to power and called you a pariah, which again raised a lot of concerns as to whether there would be cold relations or sanctions or the like. So six, seven years in power, Vision 2030 is moving slowly, but not in the way that you want it to move. And that's why I think that for Saudi Arabia, there's no necessarily objection to normalization and putting Israel at the center of these trade routes, provided these trade routes go through Saudi Arabia, which is why Saudi Arabia is very keen on that Middle East corridor and why they're actually very cold to Turkey and very unwilling to give the support that Erdogan wants because they want to ensure Turkey does not benefit from the trade routes at Saudi Arabia's expense. So I think that the general mood is that to, to answer your question in simplistic terms, because I know when you said briefly it was directed at me, I think that to answer it in simplistic terms, I think that there will be no impact whatsoever. All the signs suggest that full steam ahead with normalization, I say that with a heavy heart, full steam ahead with normalization. Jared Kushner argued in in Saudi Arabia itself, in the Davos, in the desert forum, while Gaza was being bombarded. He said that, you know, that the Saudis are excited about, you know, developing this trade and integrating Israel in the economic framework. And I think as far as Red Sea security is concerned, I think that when I, when you look at the American approach, and again, I best elaborated on it, but I think that for the Americans, they're not really too bothered who rules Sana'a, provided that they are willing to engage in cooperation to uphold security in the Red Sea. And I don't see this as something that Iran would be averse to, or even the Houthis would be averse to. Remember, the Democrats are always keen on nuclear deals with Iran, on talking with Iran. Remember, you know, beforehand, the Saudis used to always complain. The reason that they preferred Trump was that they always felt the Democrats were too sympathetic with the Iranians. Obama used to say privately that, you know, the tensions between Saudi and Iran are Saudi's fault, not Iran's fault. So the idea, I think that the the, the blunt answer to your question is, I don't think it changes anything. Uh, While I have, have, what are... uh, what are the uh, implications for Yemen through all of that? I think that when it comes to Yemen, I think that the Houthis' long-term security or future is dependent upon the ex- the appetite of Saudi Arabia to resist them. And I think that appetite is decreasing day by day. I think that the Saudis no longer want to enter into an engagement with the Houthis. And I think the Saudis themselves no longer see any real value in the internationally recognized government, aside from the legitimacy umbrella that the internationally recognized government offers them to continue their role or seat at the table. You'll note, for example, that the Saudis, while talking to the Houthis, are, in, are while they're talking as if they are a party, they're insisting that they are 
you know, Wasata Omania Saudia, you know, an, an Omani Saudi mediation. They're very insistent on presenting themselves as a mediator when everybody knows that they are talking as if they are the party to the conflict with the Houthis. I think that when it comes to Yemen, I think that while it does appear that the Houthis look on course to be entrenched in the north, it remains to be seen how Saudi and the UAE will resolve the fallout in the south, where you have the southern separatists increasingly becoming louder in their criticism subtly of Saudi Arabia in their suggestions. I mean, I'm watching some former spokespeople like Salah al and these others who are warning that the STC or Southern Separatists will be facing an existential crisis if they don't have a plan for what happens after the Houthis are recognized. There's all these scenarios being planned for when the Houthis are recognized. And I think, judging from Yemen, this is no disrespect to Yemenis, if there is no plan to handle it, Yemeni tribes know how to fight. You will, you will have resolved the North and plunged the South into a crisis. And I'm, I'm, I have to ask uh, Colonel Abbas, uh -huh. before, we, before we move to the uh, uh, audience questions, moving forward, um, what are the specific types of support that would mostly effect, uh, most effectively strengthen democrat democratic governance in Yemen? Um, you know, in subsequently sustainable peace and development between all of this, when we're, you know, when um, in in attempt to reconcile, uh, non-state actors are being strengthened. Yeah, I mean, this is like a talk earlier. This is a, at the end of the day, it's a Yemen, a Yemeni to Yemeni type uh, 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 problem. They have to figure out how to present to the world what how they do, want to get along together. But on the U.S. approach, I mean, just to give perhaps some credit to, the, to this administration, um, um, the Biden administration, they're still, their policy is uh, ending the war is a priority for them. And they, show, they showed that from day one by appointing a special envoy to Yemen. Uh, back under Obama administration, under Trump administration, there was no envoy to Yemen. I mean, that was a clear, uh, they said they wanted to uh, do that. And the uh, and uh, uh, Tim Linder King, which uh, worked with him closely for, I think he was the right guy to do it. He, uh, he's been there in the region. He knows all the players and he's been doing it. And, uh, and this is a, it takes a long time to come up to a, a somewhat solution, but at least now you have truce. Uh, for the first time in the last six, eight months or so, Sana'a Airport is functioning. People are flying in and out of Sana'a. Hodeida Port is wide open. So there's all this uh, little uh, succession uh, things happening. In the, uh, and, then, and then they have this uh, uh, Safar, uh, it is almost a disaster. Remember the Safar ship is on the uh, offshores of Hodeida, was full of uh, 1.1 million, I think, barrels of oil. They were able to drain that ship. Uh, avoiding an, a, 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 a climate, I mean, some kind of disaster uh, leak uh, there. So there, there is that that there is the diplomatic efforts ongoing all the time. Uh, the recent the Gaza uh, October seven that changed everything, and that really changed the whole dynamics, even inside Yemen. There is a lot of change. I see it right now. I mean, you have, I mean, I think there was a couple of days ago that somebody from the SDC uh, uh, basically said something about willing to work with Israel or so along the uh, or uh, or now you see, you see part of the uh, Yemeni government organizing a, a coastal guard to fight the uh, the uh, the Houthis on uh, or to stop the Houthis from uh, intercepting warships. So the, so this October seven changed a lot of dynamics beyond the control of the United States and perhaps uh, Saudi Arabia. Thank you, um, um, Colonel Abbas and uh, Sami Hamdi for your uh, uh, incredible insights. I'm looking here at the um, questions we received from the audience. Okay, we have a question here. Um, That states, we know the control of the coalition over the atmosphere and coast of Yemen, including ports. And Al Houthi was able to take the tanker and move quietly to the Yemeni coast. In the absence and difficulty in entering any tanker, it can carry aid and requirements needed by the Yemeni people. And and we did see how also the uh, World Food Program stopped their aid to Yemen. Um, does the international community support the Houthis? Uh, to hijack ships to achieve other interests. 
uh, well, de definitely not. I mean, this is uh, this, uh, and since since this was started on the international water, it is an international problem. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the Houthi government, uh, I mean the uh, Yemeni government. Uh, obviously, they can't really intercept or stop that. But that that's what uh, that's the issue. That's the issue here. Is you have a non-state actor uh, operating on the um, in the international waters. And there is no jurisdiction for anybody in there besides uh, what the United States and the coalition, uh, maritime coalition, is doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, just just a note for the audience. I mean, this this body of water from the from the Red Sea around Yemen all the way to the uh, to the uh, Indian um, uh, Ocean uh, ha has the largest presence, uh, largest naval presence in the world. I mean, you have uh, over thirty nine countries uh, in a coalition patrolling that area. This is not counting the Russian presence, not counting the Chinese pressure and presence, not counting the Iranian presence. All of them operating on this and this uh, in this areas, and still you have uh, piracy going on, and you, and you still have non-state actor like the uh, the Houthis were able to hijack a ship and also uh, move it all the way to uh, uh, to Yemen. One more point on the ship: you, probably most of you guys saw the clip of a helicopter lands on the ship and the and the uh, and the and the soldiers or uh, that came out of that. That that helicopter landing requires a highly skilled pilots. To actually, let, even U.S. helicopter or Navy pilots, they have to go a lot of training to be able to land on a ship. Landing on the ground is one thing because the ground is stable. Landing on the ship is not stable because the ship is moving up and down. And the way if you do it, you can see that these guys are either trained by the uh, Quds Force, some really highly trained uh, Yemeni pilots, or perhaps some uh, some Quds Force Quds forces behind the wheel landing the, the the helicopter to them. Uh, so it's it's an international problem, and we know we have Iran behind it. So uh, uh, we'll we'll see. So uh, I have a question here for uh, Sami. That states you mentioned John Kerry. Uh, is the John Kerry initiative currently being reformulated, and what are the reasons that prompted Saudi Arabia to accept it when they rejected it back in 2015? I think that, look, the Americans, first and foremost, are pragmatic in, in their approach and not as ideological as the regional actors. The Americans have specific goals that they want to achieve, primarily stability and the like, or, or, or at their interests. And whoever is willing to engage and talk to achieve this regard, they are willing to engage with them. And that's why Tim Lenderking himself, when he was appointed as the envoy to Yemen, was very quick to talk with all of the parties, including the Houthis. He was criticized as recognizing the legitimacy of the Houthis. But I do think that there was some merit in talking to the Houthis and recognizing that neither the Saudis nor the UAE have really an appetite to deliver the internationally recognized government back to Sana'a. So it's worth talking to the Houthis and adopting an approach through which you force the Houthis, even if you recognize them politically, you hamstring them economically and force them to rely on their neighbors, which allows you to deploy leverage to force them to engage with other Yemeni parties. I'm not saying I'm a fan of that particular view, but I'm saying that when we saw, for example, you know, uh, Sheikh Abu Ras, for example, or, or these others in, in Sana'a, when there was that sort of tension, when he criticized the Houthi government and there was, you know, scenarios being planned out, do Hizb al-Mu'tamar al-Shaab bin Am have the power to, I don't know how they have what the party's name is in English, apologies, but, but you know, the, the, the Houthi partner in government, do they have the power to topple the Houthis? And I remember seeing all these Houthi accounts, Muhammad Ali al-Houthi, Nasr al-Din Amir, al bukhaiti always trying to play down the severity of these differences, but that in itself revealed that while the Houthis appear to be strong in Sana'a, that second pillar of that they have is still very important to them, which suggests that perhaps they're not as solid in Sana'a as, as they like to present. The reason why I mentioned that is that when it goes back to your question about why do the Saudis, why are they more inclined now to talk to the Houthis or the like, General People's Congress, Ahsan Ya Hussein. But, but the, the reason why I say that is that when it comes to the Saudis or the idea of them talking to the Houthis now or adopting some of the ideas that John Kerry presented in 2014, 2015, it goes back to this point where the Saudis, they look at, you know, Ali Mohsen Lahmar, they look at, you know, Tariq Saleh, they look at Aydarus Zubaydi, they look at it and they mm. say, you know what, none of these are our, our ideal choice to lead the Yemeni front against the Houthis and none of them are particularly they're not enthusiastic options to support. And therefore, as a result, the Saudis believe 80 and 80 is nine years. All we got from this was bad PR. 
uh, wasted money. People are now saying that a militia managed to defeat a big country. ACD yeah, cut our losses and then let, 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 let's, let, let's move on from there. And the Saudi Crown Prince said it actually in an Al Arabiya interview where he said, the Houthis are Arabs, you know, they are, you know, Usulhum Arabiya, they are brothers, they are, and we asked them to return to Hudn al Arabi, you know, an indication we, we want to see if we can bring them out of the Iranian influence. The Saudis believe the Houthis can be bought. I do believe that one of the most powerful tools that Iran has is its ideology. There's no other reason to explain why Hassan Nasrallah, an Arab, is willing to compromise all of the credit he got in 2008 in that war against Israel. And he threw it all away by intervening in Syria, you know, for the sake of the Bashar al-Assad regime because the Iranians wanted him to. I think that when you look at Hadi al-Amri when in, in Iraq of the Hashd al-Shabi when he says, I'm proud to have fought with it on the Iranian side against Iraq and I do it again. I think that this ideological thing is often very much underplayed because it's something that Saudi Arabia and the UAE don't necessarily view as something significant in their own foreign policy. Or perhaps they did once upon a time. But I think that the Iranian ideology in and of itself is, is not to be underestimated. So long story short, I think the reason the Saudis are engaging now with the idea is they're tied. They don't see an alternative. Yemeni, you know, Yemenis, they like to fight, as, some of the, as a Saudi told me the other day. And, you know, there is we just see if the Houthis, if we can buy them off and force them to accept other parties with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, Colonel uh, Abbas, we're receiving multiple questions uh, regarding the classification of Houthis as a terrorist organization. Now, we do understand that one of the reasons the Biden administration has um, uh, retracted that classification was because of the humanitarian aid uh, for Yemen. Do you see anything um, on the horizon as far as that classification moving forward? after the attacks in the Red Sea? Well, according to uh, what you hear from the administration, it's still on the table. They're still looking at it. Uh, but the same thing, the humanitarian efforts are still the same thing. Uh, that uh, will complicate issues. Uh, but I think the classification, what happened under uh, under Trump, happened at the very end of their uh, his uh, tenureship. And it was hastily brought, uh, put on the list and when uh, when the Biden administration came uh, came aboard, they hastily removed it off the list. So uh, both uh, added to the list and removing it from the list was for domestic uh, politics, due to domestic uh, politics, not necessarily uh, because of the nature of the Houthis and what they're doing on the ground. So I think sometimes you know, the people overplayed that why they're in and out. But it was, I, I think, from my opinion, it was purely for a, it was a domestic uh, a domestic politics. It wasn't. Uh, uh, anything else, but yeah, it's still on the table, and I think it. Uh, um, I think they should be back on the list. Uh, what they're doing on the international seas, this is uh, the pure, uh, pure, really terrorism. Uh, this might might put some pressure on them. Do you, do you um, uh, think that perhaps by not designating them, they are trying a different uh, uh, approach than was done with Hezbollah in Lebanon? I mean, I think from the uh, from the proxies uh, writ large, whether it's in Iraq, Hezbollah, or Yemen, they don't really care about the designation. Uh, they have their, like uh, uh, Samuel was saying, they have this. They're ideologically motivated. Uh, they like their status as this uh, and this axis of resistance, and they're getting high over it, and they're uh, continue to do it regardless of sanctions or regardless of classification. Thank you. Um, trying to see if there's any more that are necessary or very pressing to answer. Um, okay. okay, one last question that I will take here. Uh, would you consider, and you know, either one of you, um, if you'd like to answer this question, would you would the U.S. consider that a possibility uh, of peace in the region would be to give the Iranian proxies um, a, an economic incentives, uh, and um, would that be an in uh, a way for normal normalcy between the U.S. and Iran? Well, okay. A quick question. I'll let you go. Uh, I think economic incentives usually it's it's going to will be given to the government writ large. I mean, the economic incentives to Yemen that include the Houthis, uh, uh, Lebanon will include Hezbollah, and so on and so forth. I mean, there's no uh, distinction there. Samuel, would you like I think also on this point, it is worth noting that the Obama administration 
allowed the Hashd al-Shaabi militias to be incorporated in the Iraqi army as a gesture to Iran to try to encourage the Iran deal. And that didn't bring much benefit. The, the, at the end of the day, the Iranian militias took it as a green light to continue doing exactly what they were doing. And uh, one of the reasons that the Gulf countries were very reluctant to invest in Baghdad afterwards was because they felt every time they invest, the money somehow turns up and ends up with the militias or ends up you know, sort of benefiting the Iranians. There was even the attempt, if you remember, Thawr al-Tishreen, the October Revolution, where the Saudis mm-hmm. made an attempt to win over Muqtada Sadr for the millionth time, where they tried to win over him and try to support him and try to say, okay, maybe he might push back against the Iranians because Muqtada Sadr had complained. He said, why is it always Maliki and Haid al-Abadi? And why am I always the one who has to reinforce them? Why can't I have my turn to rule? And they said to him, no, yeah, Muqtada Sadr, please, we want Maliki possibly to come back or somebody else. We don't want you. And he got upset and he threw the toys out the pram. But the, I think that when it comes to the, the, the idea of economic incentives, I think that, and, and I repeat it primarily because you can see even see it with the Houthis, it's a very ideological movement. This is, the, this is one of the reasons why when I started in the beginning, and it's been alluded to as well, the idea that, remember, this is the seventh time the Houthis have fought since 2004 for power. This is the seventh time that they have gone to war. They've picked up arms to go and fight for the sole purpose that they believe that the Houthi family should rule Yemen. This is an ideological objective. This is something that drives them. And and even when you see some of what they have implemented in Sana'a, when they have implemented in their territories, in terms of the books, in terms of the the, the ideas that they are propagating Mm. in Yemen, it is very much ideological. And they do talk about it in ideological terms. And that's why I think that while Saudi allies may be bought with checks and UAE allies may be bought with checks, many checks have been offered to Iranian allies and they don't give up Tehran. And I think the reason why is because they truly, if you, if you talk to them, and I assume you have, when you talk to Iranian allies, they, they truly believe in, in, in this sort of ideological, and, and that's the fear, and I finish on this point. One of the things that I fear is happening is that while the Houthis are barraging the Red Sea or, or the ships, or, or, or seizing ships, or, or disrupting the Red Sea, I won't say barraging, but disrupting the Red Sea, is that while the US and Saudi are talking about it as a threat, the very news bulletin that says that Saudi and UAE are considering joining an alliance to protect the ships has resulted in a plunge in public opinion towards these governments. Because in the words of many of them, and you can see it even on social media, they're saying, you're doing nothing for Gaza. The Houthis at least are trying to put pressure on the Israelis. Israelis and, you're and, you're going, and you're going on behalf of the Israelis, you're going to stop the Houthis. And that's resulting in this shift. And, and, and I hear it even from those who know about Yemen, who are now saying, and they are saying things like, okay, the Houthis are bad, but can you imagine if the internationally recognized government was in Sana'a? Do you think they would dare even to try to put pressure on the Israelis for the sake of Gaza? And that's why what I fear is the Houthis will not benefit much materially from what they're doing in the Red Sea, but I think they are benefiting astronomically in terms of public opinion, not inside Yemen, where Yemenis know the reality, but outside Yemen. And as we mentioned earlier, where I see on my Instagram, I landed here in Istanbul and I opened my phone and I find at least five different accounts saying Yemen has forced the ships to go all around Africa. because They're, they're referring now to the Houthis as Yemen. And, and I think that's something that if if it's not checked, will have sweeping consequences for in terms of the options that the Houthis will be able to access after this peace agreement is signed with Saudis. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Sami Hamdi and Colonel Abbas. Uh, the hook, uh, thank you for, your, for sharing your profound insights today. This was uh, an incredible conversation that needed to be had and uh, your expertise and perspectives have shed valuable light on the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead for Yemen and the region. Um, I hope to ha- continue this conversation further. I know there's uh, much more to unpack when it comes to the complexities in Yemen and uh, its connectedness to uh, everything going on in the region. So in conclusion, solving Yemen's uh, complexities, demands, uh, demands a multifaceted approach. It must address all stakeholder security concerns while respecting Yemen's sovereignty, sustain diplomacy, economic cooperation, and tackling the root cause of conflict. Poverty, inequality, and poor governance are essential for a peaceful and prosperous future. Additionally, the role of non-state actors and potential escalations must not be ignored or underestimated. 
By addressing these factors, first and foremost, we can develop a comprehensive strategy for a stable and prosperous Yemen. Thank you all for joining us today for this insightful discussion. To stay informed about the latest developments in Yemen, visit our website at wcys.org and sign up for our monthly newsletter. This will keep you up to date with our insightful monthly analysis reports, upcoming events, and discussions. Thank you once again for being here today.